Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate uh, Peggy <laughs> mentioning uh, about our grandbaby. Um, we 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 do we do have a new grandbaby, uh, and yesterday was a was a fun day because uh, I got a chance to to go and, and feed him. Uh, he is so tiny. And uh, to add to the joy, of course, uh, is when you have a, a, a pair now. And, uh, uh, she seems to like him. Huh? She seems to like him. She's, Annalie's been loving all over him, and they went over to see him, and then they went on to Arkansas, and they were showing her on the phone the picture of her and the baby together, and she hugged the phone and kissed it. <laughs> so she is really excited. And Tom, I also... Um, Put in one thing that I thought was particularly important that you would find relevant, and, and that is that uh, <laughs> you know that uh, you you must start them out young if you're going to get things uh, exactly where they need to be. So uh, just in case you were worried, uh, we're, we're right there. Okay, this morning um, I, I want it it fits in so well with what some of you have said and what Piggy said in the announcements and what was included in the prayer. There's so much stuff going. On so many challenges right now that I felt like that you know maybe it would be a good time for us to just go to something that is at the root of what's important to us. And it's a concept that we know well, but we cannot ever lose sight of it. You know, if you think about it, how, how would we get through this life without any hope, without any confidence, without any assurance of what's going to happen. You know, I, I wonder how so many people who don't have any uh, religious beliefs whatsoever, how do they get through turbulent times? What, what anchor do they have to hold on to? And there are so many that are made available to you and me as Christians that we cannot lose any level of the importance that they have. And this morning, I want us to think just a little bit about our Savior uh, as the resurrection and the life. In John chapter 11, and we're going to be studying from John 11, if you want to go ahead and, and be finding that in your Bibles and mark it, we'll be there in a little bit. But uh, here's what he told Martha. He said, Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes through me, he may die Though he may die, he shall live. How deep is that statement right there? Contrast that with what we look like in a society. In this life, we get older. Now, I had this conversation with, with uh, Jenny this morning when she came in. That somebody asked her, was her legs hurt? And she said, no, she's just getting old. I said, yeah, it, it beats the alternative. You know, that, that we have so many people who, who try to stop this process. You know, that, that we all are going to get older, we're all going to age, we're all going to decline. We had the conversation this morning. I said, I don't like this. You know, my, 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 my thumb hurts, my shoulder hurts, my legs are a mess. This is not fun. How did we get here? And of course, she's blaming me. You know? But now listen, stopping this, this problem of getting older is not new to us. You know, it, it, the ancient Greeks and the Romans, they thought that if you mixed mud with crocodile dung and put that all over you, it would stop the aging process. Some of you probably have heard of the Countess Elizabeth Bathory de Essen, who is still the greatest female serial killer in history. How's that for a distinction? And the, if you go back and read about her, what you're going to find that she did was more than just gross. It was horrific. And one of the things that she thought she could do was if she took a bath in the blood of her victims, it would keep her skin in good shape. Victorian women used to apply mercury, the actual mercury on them. And, and, and while it did take care of blemishes on their skin, it also removed their skin. <laughs> and, and today, those are things that I found that people are trying. You know, we're injecting 
toxins that cause botulism into our skin to make us look better. It has been projected that by the end of this year we will spend $331 billion on anti-aging. I'm not going to ask how many of you spend. I know how many I see in our house, so that troubles me. And it's obviously not helping anybody. You know, but what we do know is that we're all going to face immortality. All You've heard me say, all of us are terminal. And that's a fact. And so what we have to remember is, have we lost perspective on this whole notion of what life is and what's going to happen? You know, when Jesus says, I am the resurrection in the, and the life, Jesus reminds us of something that is incredibly important. And knowing that each of us will die, the scriptures give us a lot of information about what's going to happen and what we think. And the reality is that death is something that everybody is going to wrestle with. And I've put two passages up there, Genesis 3 and 19 and, and Ecclesiastes 3, and I'm going to show you those, those scriptures. In Genesis 3, uh, God is pronouncing uh, the plagues that are going to come. And, and he says, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Notice the graphic. Notice the picture. Because it says, you know, that while we may be above ground today, there's no assurance that that's where we're going to be tomorrow. And, and, and I worry about me that if there's something that I've not said to some of you that I need to say, and today is your last time to hear anything, how am I going to feel at hearing that you passed? Did I do what I needed to do? Did I, did I say what I needed to say? What is it that, that needs to be said to you to get you to do what you need to do at this point? And, and, and then in Ecclesiastes, I mean, Solomon said, For what happens to the children of man, what happens to the beast is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beast. For all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust, and to the dust all return. That's why I asked Ryan to read that. Because I want us to really stop and think about the fact that there is going to be a time in our lives where you're going to punch the time clock the last time. I had, uh, I had several jobs where we had to do that. We had to go and punch a time clock. And, and what that said to the employer was, he's done. <coughs> and that's what's going to happen in this life. You know, we're going to punch the time clock, and, and we're all going to be done. And, and that when we get into John chapter 11, Lisa, I need my Bible. John chapter 11. I'm gonna, uh, here's where we're going to spend almost all of our time, so don't get nervous when I seem to not be advancing slides much, because we'll be going on for the rest of the way. John chapter 11, I want us to start by reading uh, the first six verses together, and then I'm going to skip down to verse 11. Okay. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, her sister Martha, and it was that Mary, who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This, is, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Drop down to verse 11. 
These things happened, he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. And then the disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. And then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may go believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Why did they send for Jesus? Well, they sent to Jesus because they knew what Jesus was capable of doing. You know, no doubt Mary and Martha had heard about what Jesus had done for the, for the centurion servant who he healed. And, and he did that one without even being in the presence of the centurion servant. No doubt they would have heard about how he had healed Jairus' daughter and had made her come back from nearly the deathbed. And so when their brother Lazarus got sick, they called for Jesus because they knew what Jesus was capable of doing. Now, the journey to get from where Jesus was to the presence of Lazarus was a couple of days. In fact, it, as best we know, it was about four days by foot. He waited two days before he left. Six days after they had asked for Jesus to come, he shows up. Why did he wait? Now, time was short in their mind, but not in the mind of Jesus. In fact, if you look carefully, he says he let Lazarus die, which says he did it on purpose. When he gets there, he finds himself in the aftermath of a funeral. And it was in this context that Jesus says to them that I am the resurrection and the life. And they believed that he had come too late. Hey, all of us, I dare say almost all of us, if not all of us, have stood at the graveside of someone who has passed that we dearly love. And we have stood there and grieved and hurt in pangs knowing that that person was gone. And here's what you've got to remember. One of these days, somebody's going to stand and grieve over you. You ever stop to think about that? You know, what, what is it going to say to them that you have gone? Because now, here's what we find. We're going to read verses 17 through 37. Here's why Jesus delayed. So when Jesus came, he found that he'd already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Mar Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. And then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, through though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, and who is to come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher has come, and he's calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but he was in the place where Martha met him. And then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw Mary rose up quickly and went out and followed her, saying, She's going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was, 
and saw him, she fell down at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. And then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? What an emotional scene that we have read. Funerals then lasted days. They lasted weeks. Where was Jesus when they needed him? Now, the Jews' uh, custom was that someone had to wait three days to be absolutely certain that the person had died. Four days after he dies, Jesus goes their way. And it's only after he gets there if when they say to him, if Lord, if you had only been here, he'd be alive. Verse 33 is an interesting verse. It says that he groaned in his spirit. Jeff, I know you like to do word studies. If you want to do an interesting word study, study the Greek word that is used in this verse for groaning. It means angry. It means agitated. And the commentaries all say the same thing. It is the same phrase that is used to describe when a horse snorts. Jesus was groaning in his spirit and he broke down in tears. And so here's we are. He says, where have you laid him? He's in the tomb. Verses 38 through 44. Then Jesus again groaning in himself came to the tomb. It was a cave and the stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench. He's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was laying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that if you have heard me, and you know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And now when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, Loose him. Let him go. Emotionally, when we see Jesus weeping. He's knocked to his knees emotionally. Mary had been. Martha had been. It even says that the crowd was crying. And Jesus said, I am the source of life and the resurrection. Remove the stone. Here's where the object lesson gets involved. Now, when they go to remove that stone, what is happening in the minds of Mary and Martha? Oh no, we've just been through all of this and now we're going to have to go through it again, exposing them to all the grief and heartache that they have experienced. You been there with a loved one who died? They, they took their last breath and then you had to go to the funeral home and set everything up. And then you had to have a visitation. And then you had to have a funeral. And then you had to have a burial. 
And every time one of those things happens, the flood of emotion that you go through just absolutely drains you. It's kind of fascinating what your mind does. I don't remember a whole lot about when my father died. I remember that he was in the hospital in intensive care for a long time. I remember that, that he passed away and we had a funeral. I remember two of my closest friends at that time walking in the back door of the funeral home in St. Louis who had come from Henderson, Tennessee. I don't remember much of anything else. And I think that's because that's what I choose to do. It's for my own protection. Jesus tells them to remove the stone. Oh no, not again. The, the, the removal of the stone, the burial cloth that Lazarus comes out in are all visual reminders. But in this case, they're visual reminders of something pretty spectacular. They are visual reminders of when Jesus says that I am the life and the resurrection. They are visual reminders that death can't hold him. I love the phrase, don't let it escape you. Unbind him, set him free. You catch it? Isn't that what happens in resurrection? With all of the pain and suffering, whatever we may go through, whatever it's an accidental death or, or sickness or whatever happens, maybe it's just old age and the body wears out, that we go through all of that and, and, and then we go through the process of, of them doing embalming or, or, or you know, whatever the de post-death process is, maybe we're going to be you know, turned into ashes. But then in the resurrection unbind and set free. That may be the most comforting thing that Jesus ever said. It was an unforgettable display of what the power of God really is. Jesus shows us what death will be like at the end of time. A time that's coming for everyone. And by the words of Christ, His spoken word, people will come forth. Lazarus, come forth. The day of judgment, come forth. And the graves will be opened and the dead in Christ will rise first. Everyone will come forth at the word of the Lord. But can't we all at this moment in our life see ourselves in the mind of Mary and Martha? And that with all the stuff that's going on, even with Lazarus when he got sick, Lord come. I, as best we can tell, they, they called him two days before he died. Then he, with the travel and delay, and you know, all of us reach a point where we worry about what's happening in the world. We, are, we worry about what's happening in life. And the truth is, it is the unbind and set free that we are after the most. And, and God's power is not just reserved for us at the end of our life or in the day of resurrection. Do we really sense God's power in our life every day? And what a difference it can make. How much did God's power change the life of Mary and Martha? And when Paul writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians 1, that the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to the working of great might, that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at the right hand in the heavenly places, 
that, that that is going to be exactly the same great might and power that's going to raise us from the dead. What he did for Jesus, what he did for Lazarus, he's going to do for us. And that should give us incredible hope. That should overshadow any type of circumstance that we face in this life knowing that this is not the end. <coughs> And he goes on in that same letter to the Ephesians and says, Now to him who's able to do more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. The power that God has is for us. And that's something that we always have to remember. And without Jesus, life is pretty pointless, if you think about it. You know, you stay busy, you do one thing much like the day before, and you go through and you do this and you do that, and every now and then you stop and you do something wonderful, and you take a trip, and, and, and you, you, you get out and, you know, reflex and, and relax and, and spare yourself, and then some days are bad and terrible things happen, and you know, horrible things are happening in, in Haiti and Afghanistan and, and you know, New Orleans is, is, couldn't get people out of the hospitals fast enough so they left them in the hospitals and now they're facing a, a, a huge uh, weather issue coming. All the horrible things that come over and over and over again. And if you don't have any hope, that's your life. But when Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the life. I am the life and the resurrection. Everything starts to take on a different perspective. Our whole life is different. And, and I think the Apostle Paul understood it. Because he said, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Anything we do in this life, anything that happens to us in this life is a blip on the radar. Bink, and it's gone. And in comparison to eternity, it is a speck so microscopic you can't even see it. How do you make sense of this life when you don't have any hope? If you don't have a relationship with the Lord, what do you do during life's darkest moments? What are you doing right now so that when your loved ones stand at your gravesite and they look down at you, they have no worries. They know where you are or they know where you're headed. And, and it's not just about you and your eternity. It's about those who you leave behind. You know, those, those pictures that I showed you, those two little ones there at the end. You know, when Pops is gone, I, I want them to have some knowledge of, of who God is and what a difference He can make in our lives. Even though Jesus could have healed Lazarus, He let him die. And that was hard because he loved him dearly. But he did so because he wanted to make a lesson. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. That you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Paul told the church at Thessalonica, don't be like everybody else. Your situation is different than theirs. And what's sort of fascinating is, while we may want a loved one to get well, and I think it's very appropriate for us to pray for that, we should never lose sight of the fact that there's something bigger that lies ahead. And that's what we find out in Revelation chapter 7. Revelation 7 reminds us that they are not dead. They're standing before the throne of God. They are in white robes. They are singing praises to God. They are in the glory of God. They are in the presence of God. 
Jesus is our intercessor with them, and we are all going to be there like those loved ones who died before us who will stand in the presence of God. What did Paul say? It's far better to go and be with the Lord. Because it is. I don't know how all of the end of life works. I've studied it a lot. I've studied as best I can about what happens after the end of life and what's going to happen in the resurrection and all of that sort of thing in judgment. But I can count on the fact that I can understand that when Paul says it's better to be with the Lord, that's an absolute. And, and so you and I, we, we have hope for our hurt. We have a measure of life that we have been given that provides with us some reason why in every circumstance it's going to be okay. And I also believe that it gives us some motivation, some encouragement for why it's important for us to always believe that we want to go to heaven, but we've got to take other people with us. Quite frankly, Tom talked this morning about Beach Grove being a perfect church. Let me tell you, I don't think we're doing what we are doing in bringing out others to Christ. Plain and simple. Feel free to disagree. I think we've got some work to do. And it's not going to happen as a group. It's probably going to happen individually. And there needs to be people showing up with you that we don't recognize because you have brought them in. I can't imagine a life without Christ. I can't imagine one where we have no relationship with God. Life would have no meaning, no purpose. We would just be floundering. I'm going to close with this thought. Jesus had been sacrificed. Jesus had hung on a cross. He had suffered. He had been taken down. He had been placed in a tomb. And three days later, he had come forth from that tomb. Many people had seen him when he came back. Remember the two people on the Emmaus Road? Now, they had seen all that had happened to Jesus. And Jesus appeared to them. The scripture says that he spoke to them, that he preached to them about himself, but he never revealed who he was. And they invited him to go into their home and have a meal. And he did. And then he told them who he was. And then we have this recorded. Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? While he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and they returned to Jerusalem. Don't miss that. When they got home and they found out who he was and they remembered what he taught them on the road, they got up and they immediately went back to the place where Jesus had been tried and killed and buried. Why did they do that? Because their understanding of what life is and the power in the resurrection